My next guest just won the Nobel Prize in economics. He's also at the University of Chicago and the co-author of a best-selling book called Nudge. Here is Richard Thaler. So thank you for coming on the show. Uh, okay. I need to so preface this by saying that I've got a ton of questions about stupid things that I do with my money, mm -hmm. but I want to start. I charge for that. Yeah, that's right, that's right. But once I get you going, I feel like you won't even know what's happening. Yeah, okay. uh, but I want to start broad. And broad is, what is behavioral economics? And I've never taken an economics class, which is bad for me, but I can't believe what I read in the book, Misbehaving, which is that economics, classic economics, is based on this idea that human beings act in a idealized, rational way. And you come along with some colleagues in the 70s and you say, what are we doing? This is crazy. Humans are idiots. <laughs> True? Well, I wouldn't use the word idiot yeah. on TV. <laughs> so, um, but you that's know. what it is, that we make decisions with, our emo with emotion. Uh, emotion, and uh, a lot of decisions are hard. And, you know, that's why we have Google Maps. Before we got lost. Yeah. You know, now. Uh, or talk get... to the guy at the gas station. Yeah, right. Which Remember sucks. that? Yeah. Or those maps? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, think about um, saving for retirement. The economic model of that is people figure out how much they're going to earn over the rest of their lifetime. Then they figure out how much they're going to want to smooth. So they're going to want to save up for their have a yacht when they retire. Yeah. Then they invest just the right amount to achieve all of that. And they never get distracted by a big TV or, or a fancy car. And, and that's what classical economics would have said beforehand. They wouldn't even brought in the TV. Is that where you came in and said, I want a TV? Or people want a TV? Yeah, well, or I noticed that lots of people are saving nothing. And <laughs> nothing doesn't seem to be the solution to that problem. <laughs> Can you define a few terms for me? Mental accounting. That comes up in your book quite a bit. In all your, in yeah, all, a lot of your books. Yeah, it's my favorite thing in life. Mine too. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, let me give you an example. One yeah. of my favorite stories. Okay. Uh, I used to teach at Cornell before I came to sh Chicago. And um, I had a colleague there who had a genius idea. At the beginning of each year, he would set aside some money, say two grand that he would plan to give to the United Way at the end of the year as his charitable contribution. Then anything bad happens to him, like scrapes the side of his car or speeding ticket or whatever, he deducts it. <laughs> right? This is genius. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's nothing, not good for the United Way. Nothing. Well. No. Not necessarily. Because? Because I kept pointing this out to him, that he had to be generous to the United Way in order to be covered for larger losses. <laughs> yeah. That's right? a good point. You know, so one year he had a vacation house and there was a hurricane and that roof blew off. He wasn't covered because it was only two grand. You know, yeah. the roof was like 20 grand. Yeah. I said, you know, Hal, raise the... Raise it up, and then yeah. next year he raises up, so he's given more. So uh, that's like, that's a mental accounting story, right? Okay. So he's playing, of course, there, right? There is no United Way account, except in his head. But it makes him feel better. And um, I'll, I'll give you another mental accounting story. You, you go to the casino, I do. You see some, <laughs> do you? Sometimes. Oh, we need to talk about that. Okay. Yeah. You, you, uh, you go to this casino, you see somebody has won some money early in the evening. Let's say they brought $500 for their gambling outing and they've won $500. They'll take the money they won, they put it in one pocket. Yeah. They put the money they brought with them in a different pocket. The money they've won, there's a name for that. It's called the house money. 
playing with house money. You're playing with the house money, all right? That's an expression. Yeah. That's a mental accounting expression. Are you saying it doesn't make sense? Of course it makes no sense. Why? <laughs> because the money in this pocket will buy exactly <laughs> as same amount of pasta yeah. as the money in the other pocket. But you didn't have it before. You, so what? <laughs> You're right. If you lose that, <laughs> if you lose that money, you know, then you won't be able to go buy as much pasta. You're right again. What Let, uh, you I talk think about? This has been a great interview. It has been. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about something called it's similar to this sunken cost. Sunk cost. Sunk cost. Uh, they're not sunken. They don't sink. They don't. They're, they're, they're just. They're, they've already sunk. Sunk. Yeah. They've so, sunk. They're sunk. So if I buy tickets. Like to, to the interview show. show. Yeah, right. And there's a blizzard. Right. It doesn't matter whether I go or not. Yet I might think I need to go because I've already spent the money and what a waste it would be. But your point is, you already spent the money. It doesn't matter whether you go or not. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll give you another example. Let, yeah, let's suppose you uh, bought these tickets and then a friend calls you up and said, you know, I was just changing planes at O'Hare, yeah. and my flight was canceled. So I'm in town. You want to go out for dinner tonight? Yeah. Oh, well, no, I have, I have these tickets at the yeah. hideout. That would Maybe be, it's something less that appealing than going really to my stupid. show, and then I can see what you're that talking would, about. That would be really stupid, yeah. you know, because you could come to the hideout some other night. Sure. And this friend is just here tonight. So, But people make this mistake all the time, that they think, because I paid for it, I have to use it. Just like your mother told you, finish the food on your plate. Every night. Because they're starving people in China or something yeah. like that. That's what my mother told me. And I kept saying, how does me eating <laughs> my broccoli help them? Yeah. And, and Shut up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know? So. And then you proved it for your whole career just to. <laughs> Show your mom. Yeah, no, I kept, I kept trying to convince her. Uh, no, it was, ne I, ne I never got through to her. No. So when you go, you were at Cornell, and then yeah. you go to the University of Chicago. Yeah. And that's kind of like going into the belly of the beast, right? Because yeah, that's classic right, yeah. Chicago school of economics. Right. Were you, were you accepted with open arms? Um, mostly. Yeah. There was one guy. Not so much. <laughs> he actually literally, you're not going to believe, literally would not look at me. Like he was, he would walk down the hall and he'd, he'd do that. And so he took it personally. Yeah. But everybody else, um, you know, the, uh, the University of Chicago the, um, has, a very intense intellectual environment. Sure. People love arguing. Yeah. They love arguing with some idiot like me because, you know, they'll give a long list of stupid things I'm saying <laughs> that they can easily contradict. <laughs> so uh, I think having me around was sort of entertainment. How do you define the classical school of Chicago economics? Like, what is that? Well, I mean, there are two parts of it. Part of it is just regular economics like you were talking about. The old Chicago school, which goes back to Milton Friedman, um, was a sort of libertarian philosophy that let markets take care of things and yeah. everything will be fine. And, um, you know, I don't, there are still libertarians uh, around, but, there aren't too many people at the University of Chicago who are still disciples of that old Chicago school. Well, one thing we get from the book, Nudge, is that when you think about, if you can think about how humans actually behave, how people actually behave, that they don't behave like robots or whatever, econs is what you call them, right. in classical economics models, then that gives you some power, right? It gives you this ability, whether you're a private company or whether you're the government, to nudge people in a certain direction, to get right. to do certain things. Yep. So that's, that's powerful. That can be powerful, yeah. or dangerous, or good stuff. 
Yeah, so whenever anybody asks me to sign a copy of Nudge, I always sign it, Nudge for Good. That's good. Uh, and, and that's a plea. Yeah. Because you can nudge for evil. Can I give you an example from my own life that I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I know yeah, it's a chart, yeah. I'll pay yeah. you later. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a pool pass in my town that every year my wife and I debate whether to get the pool pass, which is one large fee, or do we go and pay per time we go to the pool? Mm -hmm. And we always hit it right about really close. There's some years we barely go to the pool at all and we lose money. So that makes us think the next year, absolutely don't get the pool pass. But my thinking is just get the pool pass, sunk cost, who cares? Go if you don't go, don't go if you don't go. Am I right? <laughs> You know, uh, I could sell you stuff, you know? <laughs> because, you know, suppose I'm going to sell you a pass to come visit me in my office yeah. at the University of Chicago. It's going to cost five grand. Sure. I'm in. Yeah. yeah. That's what students do every year. They spend 40 grand. <laughs> <laughs> And then they find out I'm not in my office. <laughs> Congrats to associate producer Adam Pindle, our employee of the month. Funding for the interview show is provided by Lagunitas. Beer speaks, people mumble, except on the interview show. The Lagunitas Tap Room in Chicago is at 2607 West 17th Street.